I'm going to take 15 minutes and then we're going to have questions and answers. So I'll just go through it and then ask for questions. Okay. Wonderful. So there are four steps. One, choose the area. Two, get people on board. Three, make it appear intentional. And four, plan, install, and maintain the plans. Next. Okay. Um, there we go. So this is one of three examples. The Huckleberry Lane example. First, we chose the area. Here it is. Two resident instigators. I and Sharon Grace chose this area. It was good because it's not a townhome yard, so it's nobody's particular territory. And it was used by a few dog walkers and lawn games, not much else. Next. So the first, the second step thing we did was to get people on board. We discussed with Lane residents, nine people volunteered for a resident task force. We got management support. We planned funding from residents. This was funded by residents with some in-kind support from management. We checked every step along the way and we informed the entire community next. Step three, make it look intentional. We had a neat border of mowed lawn. We planted in groups and swaths and we posted this sign. You could also use a birdhouse, a sculpture, a border of stones or fence or mulch, a mowed path, a bench. Think of how you can make an area that you let go wild or turned into a meadow. Think how you can make it look intentional. Next. And now here's the longest and hardest part. <laughs> Plan, install, maintain. So we looked around for our town for models and this is a nearby firm which has used this area between its mowed lawn and its parking lot to install native ground sumac and some shrubs and trees. That was a model for us, next. Here's another model, of what they've done, same company. Here they've used grasses and some areas of stone and some shrubs, next. So here's us, how are we gonna go from us to them? <laughs> So the first thing we did was to check every step with residents and management. And then the first action was to stake a new mow line. And this white sign, and there are many of them all along the mow line of two full lanes. And then we gave everybody three days to come and look at the signs and say, oh, you know, I really like to have the area under the tree mowed, so let me move the line and all that. So we got everybody in Quakerly <laughs> consensus, or just uh, tired of complaining. Then we researched online, what shall we put here besides this mowed grass? And what we learned was that shrubs planted directly into the grass is the cheapest, easiest plan. You think, oh, we'll have a mow, uh, we'll have a meadow, but meadows can take quite a lot of work. So we decided on shrubland. Then we made a budget, we planned 96 shrubs. They were gonna be two to six feet tall, so not very high. In number one pots, which are eight inches diameter, so small pots, easily managed. And we were able to get them from a nursery that grows plants for the restoration trade, which means they grow them very close together, which means some of them are a little crooked and they're all a little scraggly and they cost $14 per plant. You go into the local nursery, you'd pay 25 to 50. And if you put them in a nice open space and give them appropriate love and attention, they will do just fine. These were beautiful, healthy plants. So then we now know where we're going to get the plants. We know we're going to use shrubs. So now we look, used books and the lists that the nursery provided to choose 13 native species. And we put bamboo stakes, which you can almost hardly see in this picture, but lots of bamboo stakes um, should go. And then we gave everybody three days to walk around and look at the bamboo stakes and say, ah, is this where you want the bamboo stakes? And everybody agreed. So then next. <clears throat> and these are the shrubs we chose. These are all native shrubs, straight natives, not natives that have been messed with. So they have double blooms or anything like that. Because if you choose those kinds of plants, sometimes they interfere with the plant's ability to do its job for wildlife. 
So double blooms and all that sort of stuff, don't do it. One of the plants we chose was winterberry, and here's a picture of a winterberry, mature winterberry bush elsewhere in our landscape. Great food for birds. And this winterberry supports 134 different species of Lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths. And by support, we mean not just nectar, because they can get, butterflies can get nectar from a lot of plants, including alien plants. But the larvae, the, the uh, little caterpillars are very, very picky. 90% of native caterpillars will feed on only one or a few species of plants. It's like the monarchs with the, with the um, um, milkweed, right? If they can't get milkweed, they're, they're gone. That's what's happening. So we wanted plants that would support lots of species. And these are the species, these numbers of Lepidoptera that these plants support. High bush blueberry takes the prize with 286. Next. Wow. So um, now we dug 96 holes, but cheating. We had help from somebody's son and grandson. <laughs> <laughs> But the holes for number one pots only have to be as deep as the pot, so nine inches deep and twice as wide. That's, that's the, the best way to plant. So they weren't terribly large holes and we got them all done, 96. And then a few days later, four residents drove in their cars to the nursery to fetch the plants. And the nursery workers were just amused at these <laughs> people coming in and saying, okay, put these plants in this car and these plants in this car. And then on planting day, the residents put in the plants and here you see us doing it. Next. Mm. We put out chairs for resident, what we call cheerleaders who could not plant. Next. And when all the plants were installed, we had a party. <laughs> All Lane residents were invited, whether they had planted or not, and here we are. <laughs> Next. Yeah. Now we have to maintain these shrubs. So one of the things we're going to be doing and have been doing is to remove invasive shrubs in the new area as they appear, and they will, and in the adjacent woods, or you see uh, in the earlier slide that there was a hedgerow of trees and shrubs behind our chosen area and it had invasive plants in it. And if we didn't get those out of there, they were gonna be a constant problem in our new area. So um, we took out those invasives and uh, a lot, residents did a lot of it, but we also hired one guy to help us for a day who really knew what he was doing. So we hand pulled the small invasives, but for the other ones, we used cut stump method. And that's when you cut the thing off the ground or if you have arthritic knees, as close to the ground as you can, and then you coat the stump with an herb herbicide with a sponge tool. So there's no drip and no spray. It goes on the stem of the plant. It makes its way down into the roots and interferes with the plant's metabolism and kills it. Next. We laid out soaker hoses among the uh, shrubs for the first two years. After that, natives don't need extra water. They don't need fertilizer. They don't need pesticides or herbicides except for the cut stump on the invasives and they don't need mulch. Next. The first summer, Virginia rose, it bloomed, bless us little heart. And you see the soaker hose lying there and you see all the grasses growing up that are now unmowed. Next. And in the second summer, you can see that everything has just popped. And it's hard to see against the vegetative background, but that rose has grown enormously. It was full of blooms in the spring. This is a native rose, by the way, not your traditional garden rose. Um, and it supports lots of wildlife. And it makes rose hips. So if you see the little red rose hips on there, that'll give you an idea of how big this one rose has grown. And then in the background, um, turning that beautiful russet gold color is um, hazelnut. Next. Mm -hmm. 
problems. We had rabbit damage. We tried to choose shrubs that were rabbit proof and some of them were, the rabbits didn't touch them. Some of them, however, got damaged. So you can see in that picture, the little uh, chicken wire fence, we fenced them. We just took chicken wire, formed it into a circle like this and used ground staples to hold it to the ground. And in one of our areas, <laughs> which we didn't know, um, there are a couple of sassafras trees in the hedgerow behind. Sassafras, it turns out, uh, proliferates and colonizes vigorously from underground shoots. And if you cut those underground shoots and the saplings off, you run the, and poison them, you run the danger that the poison will go back to the mother tree through the umbilical cord, you might say. Oh. So we got a problem. This area, mother nature wants this to be a sassafras woods. And we have two choices. We can let it and eventually they will crowd out the shrubs we put in, but it will be a very good area for wildlife because this is a native tree. Or we can go through and cut 50 to 100 little sassafras shoots every year. We'll see what happens <laughs> next. <laughs> so now the second part of the Huckleberry story is that we found we had an accidental meadow. So we ran out of time and money and we were unsure of possible Lathrop building plans. So part of the unmowed area was left alone for the first year. And in the second year, we used our little bit of extra money to plant shrubs very sparsely, every two or 20 or 30 feet. And they're little, you know. And in between the shrubs, we continued to let grow whatever came. We didn't mow it, we didn't do anything to it. And voila, we had an accidental metal. Let's take a look, next one. Ha, first thing that happened in our accidental meadow was that an invasive ground cover covered everything, Creeping Charlie. But then the natives that could compete with this began to arrive. And what do you see here? You see native goldenrod, very good for Lepidoptera and all kinds of other uh, good, good critters. And then we got bone set and we got blue vervain and we got different kinds of asters. Ha, huh, imagine that. They just volunteered. There we came, mother nature. And then we began to add some plugs that we took out of our own gardens of native plants and we'll see how well those survive and compete. But there's a list there of what we might use that very aggressive, tough native plants. We could have a meadow here, it wouldn't be perfect, but it would be a meadow. So everybody who says, oh, meadows are so expensive and, and they require so much work. Yes, they do if they're planned, but not if they're an accidental meadow. Next. So this is the second example. First was the huckleberry with its shrubs and its accidental meadow. meadow. Now comes the second example. And this is what Delaney was talking about. This is the in native garden. It's a small area. It was more planned and more expensive. It was a landscaped area in bad shape with invasive plants that are now illegal in Massachusetts. And by the way, in your own state, get up that list of illegal uh, plants and see if you have any on your campus because it's not illegal to keep them growing if they're already there, but we found it was a very good argument to our community and our management that we had here in front of our inn, despite our touting ourselves as this wonderful nature loving uh, retirement community in front of our inn, we had plants that if you were to install them new, you would be breaking the law. So again, we checked with everybody this time, and this is what made it more expensive. We had a designer design this garden, get the plants for us, these are little plugs um, and come and put them in place where they belong next. And residents planted them. And here's what happened. It all came up. It's a beautiful meadow. We put a sign up to make it look uh, planned. Next. And here it is. Wow. Next. And here it is, it is in a different season, a little bit later. And you can see what's starting to happen. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The plants are beginning to move around because they do. Next. We did pres uh, programs for residents about the native garden because most people were enthusiastic, but a few people said, oh, what a mess. <laughs> Why don't they take care of that garden? So this is one of our residents who knows a lot about native plants, Alice, um, who uh, has a background as a landscape designer. And she has taken some plants from the native plant garden and she's holding 
a public program for residents to explain what these plants are and do for, for our native critters. Next. And uh, of course there were problems. Weeding and cutting down plant stalks in the spring is a constant need and we can't do it all with volunteers. So every year we spend three, four, five hundred dollars to hire somebody to take care of this. And the plants are moving around, so it doesn't look as neat as that first picture of the yellow and white. And some native plants in there are too aggressive, particularly switchgrass. So we hired a guy to dig it out. It, it, you can't dig it out. It roots too deeply, so it'll be back. But here we are with some volunteers um, putting some new plants in, which we hope will compete with the switchgrass. Next. So this is the third example, the tea berry native plant garden. The tea berry was a berm. It was a, a little hill, which meant, which was meant to separate your view from your across, because this is a circle, across to your neighbor's front yard. But the residents wanted a gathering place. And this one was funded by a single resident with some help from one other resident. So that's another way to do it is to get a donor. So we hired everybody, we, we hired people to clear and level the ground. We hired a professional to design and install the garden. The big problem, of course, is ongoing weeding and watering, which residents have been doing, and it's a stretch. Next. But look at this. This is it. This is what they did. They made this. And it's gorgeous. And it supports all kinds of birds, butterflies, other kinds of critters. You see the little uh, birdhouse up at the left? Mm -hmm. Next. And how we made it look planned. You'll see there's a little mowed border along the edge. And then there is a row of one kind of grass. It looks planned. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the path and the benches and the bluebird house. And yes, the bluebird house successfully housed a bluebird family. <laughs> <laughs> Next. So what did we accomplish? We supported hundreds of species of butterflies and moths, plus many other beneficial insects, the birds that eat them, and all the creatures that live in shrub and meadowland. We made our campus more beautiful, more interesting, and unique among retirement communities, and residents come because of that. People are attracted. We sequestered more carbon, we stopped air and air pollution and noise pollution. These native plants need no fertilizer. After the first year, they don't need extra water. They don't need chemicals except a little help to remove invasive shrubs. And a, a big, big side effect was we created bonds among residents who worked together to create our beautiful shrublands and meadows. And we have lots of good excuses for parties. The end. <laughs> Questions? Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. That was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Does anyone have any questions for Barbara? Well, I'd like to know a little bit more while people are thinking of their questions of the species of birds, especially, and maybe butterflies that you've seen. You mentioned a bluebird. What other species uh, have people been noticing in these areas? The uh, chickadees and the um, uh, warblers make use of the seeds from the plants. Uh -huh. um, and so we see more birds in that area than you would ever see if it were a traditional garden. Uh -huh. it, uh, we've seen uh, monarchs in there because we have a species of milkweed. And in fact, uh, you can find monarch uh, um, chrysalises in there, as well as chrysalises of other stuff, since I'm not an entomologist. I don't know what they all are, but wow. I just bless them as I pass and say, <laughs> hatch, little one. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that, that monarchs were um, up that far north. I guess I'm I'm in Southern California, so I, I don't know why I thought it was sort of a, a, <laughs> nope, a warm yeah. weather. Yep. But yes, I will say something about the non, we accidentally got non-native milkweed and it, it damages the monarchs. You can yeah. see it right away. So yeah. you have to always make sure it's native milkweed that you're planting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, anybody else? Questions, comments? And most of you are muted, so you'll need to unmute yourself if you need to say anything. 
How long, Barbara, was the process between when you began and now? Each of these examples began at a different time. Okay. The most recent is the first example, the Huckleberry Lane. It began two years ago. The In Native Garden is now about mm, five or six years old. And the third example, the tea berry, that was a berm in the lane, um, mm -hmm. that began, I think, uh, two, two, maybe three years ago. Were there any objections amongst residents at all or amongst the staff for the cost? And you all, you bore the cost, didn't you? So we, we did, uh, except for some uh, in kind help from, uh, yeah. from uh, management, which they gladly gave. The management is very happy with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we keep them constantly in the loop and we plan with them. Uh, however, um, there are some, I would say, a minority, a distinct minority of residents who either don't understand very well what we're doing or think that these areas look too messy and unkempt. And what we do about that, of course, is to try to make the areas look well cared for in all the ways we talked about and to write in our newsletter about the areas and about the birds and creatures that are um, appearing in them and um, uh, Peter and Tinka, for example, Peter, raise your hand. There he is. <laughs> um, so several of our residents, including Peter and Tinka have been um, very active in tracking our bluebirds in our bluebird houses. You saw one in the, in the tea berry example and mm -hmm. just letting people know, putting it out on the media that we share as a community. So to try to, um, educate people. And you know, what needs to happen in this country is that people have to be educated so that an, a, a, a lawn or a, an area of their, of their place that is alien shrubs and mowed grass looks ugly. <laughs> and what looks beautiful to them are these beautiful meadows that we're creating. Yeah. You have to change their perception. Right. Uh, Dorothy from Oberlin. Barbara, I just wanted to thank you for that program. Um, and I applaud your energy. And I love the idea that we can all pick up little snippets. We're doing quite a bit of that at Oberlin, but always, always we can pick up ideas like your idea of um, the signs so people know it's intentional and not just not cared for. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Those signs were very inexpensive. We went to the local copy shop I gave him a rough draft of what we wanted and the guy designed it. And I think that sign that you saw was under 30 bucks. Wow, okay, yeah. Nice. Wow, anybody else? 